Okay, so today I wanted to make a quick video um, about a topic that has been uh, bouncing around the internet and YouTube for a while, and this is regarding Panerai and what it is to be an in-house movement, and is that really important in the grand scheme of things. So to talk about this today, I have three watches on the table from my collection. I have in the center a Panerai 372, a Panerai 112, and a Rolex Submariner No Date. These watches are chosen because they give me some room to talk about the topic um, and demonstrate uh, the differences and the distinctions of in-house or not in-house. And is that really important to you? So first of all, if we're going to talk about in-house and Panerai or Rolex or any other brand, um, we need to discern exactly what does it mean to be in-house. And that is open to interpretation with a lot of people. Uh, let's start with probably the more familiar um, area for uh, most people. Um, so for example, with the Rolex Submariner, um, a lot of people consider um, Rolex to be in-house. And it gets a pass on that from most people. Um, and, you know, I'm okay with that. Um, but if we're going to talk about what in-house really means, and that means to be a fully integrated manufacturer and the movements to be fully created by this manufacturer, this manufacturer alone, um, not available to anybody else or not used anywhere else or not derivative in any form. Um, for me, frankly, um, Rolex has to be put aside a little bit. I'll address that in a minute. Um, we go to perhaps what some people, whoops, some people may see, <laughs> see is the other extreme, and that would be uh, early Panerai, Betterini cases, um, pre-Vendome, early Richemont, with the, uh, the Unitas type movement inside. Let's take a focus on that. So this is an early um, 6497 derived Unitas Panerai movement, um, fully decorated as in the earlier series. This is a PAM 112E, so it has the more decorated internals on it. Um, some people probably would consider this not to be truly in-house um, because it is derivative of a Unitas movement. In the center, we have the Panerai 372. This was one of Panerai's earlier in-house movements. Um, the P3000, as you can see. The P3000 was developed in-house by Panerai after it had become part of the Richemont group. And as such, um, Panerai was able to benefit from the watch manufacturing skills within that group. Uh, most notably, perhaps, was JLC. Um, I do have a JLC master control sector dial, and JLC is one of those that I consider among the Swiss to be uh, fully in-house. They do make movements for other manufacturers, of course, most notably Audemars Piguet. Now again, in-house, what is in-house? I say JLC is probably in-house because they do make pretty much everything, especially in the movements, um, while others do not. I don't think you can really criticize Panerai for not being in-house, where this one uses a derivative of a 6497 Unitas movement. This one um, uses skills that are available within the Richemont house. These you cannot really criticize too much for not being in-house if you're going to accept that Rolex is in-house. Because whereas Panerai did have some criticism early in the days, particularly from some particular um, you know, on-again, off-again Panerai web bloggers, they would say that Panerai was you know, derivative, it was made by Rolex, um, Rolex um, was contracted by Panerai to make the earlier um, models, uh, the pre-war, early World War II era Panerais. While this is true, you have to question, was Rolex really in-house at the time? Because Rolex, as started by Hans Wilsdorf, was really um, an assembler of watch parts. Uh, like every other, or most other, manufacturers at the time, uh, Hans Wolsdorf would go out and look at what was available in terms of cases, movements, hands, other materials, and assemble them um, on contract to his specifications. 
Now he had the brilliance of marketing to be able to sell this as you know his own product, uh, you know, which it was to some extent. You know, the the talent it takes to assemble parts and put them together in a certain way is a skill, and it is to be applauded. But again, um, it's a far cry from in-house. In the early part of the 20th century, Rolex was an exclus- exclusively contracted Aigler to make its movements for them, um, and Aigler did so, uh, you know, for most of the century. Uh, until Rolex acquired them in 2004, which might, you know, then say, okay, this watch, um, the 114060, you know, is made after the Aigler purchase in 2004, so perhaps this can be considered fully in-house. Um, but, you know, it was an acquisition, very much like Richemont acquired um, other brands and Panerai benefited from that. Um, Rolex also, of course, as we all well know, and benefited from Zenith movements. Um, if there wasn't for Zenith, we probably wouldn't have the Daytona we have today because arguably um, Zenith movements saved the Daytona um, before they made their own in-house movements, which are, in truth, a simplification of the Zenith movement. So again, uh, the distinction of in-house and not in-house uh, does have some gray areas. So again, turn these over. And I'll look at the movements. In-house versus non-in-house. Okay, back to World War II era Panerai. Um, it's true that Rolex was contracted to assemble cases uh, and, and watches for Panerai. But again, at the time, we're talking about 1920s, 1930s and, and forward um, era. You know, these Rolexes that were... Um, you know, essentially Panerai. Panerai did the dials and things like that. Uh, the movements were made by Corbert. As to the best of my knowledge, Rolex did not make its own movements at the time. So again, Rolex was playing the role of a parts assembler, um, you know, bringing things together to make a quality product. Again, the product was quality, so I'm not going to knock that. But they didn't make movements. Uh, so if you're going to knock Panerai for subcontracting to Rolex, at the time, you'd have to knock Rolex for subcontracting out to other manufacturers at the time. Um, so, you know, if you're going to start talking about in-house, not in-house, and, and say that has some kind of intrinsic value to it, then you really have to be careful about uh, defining in-house versus outsourcing parts. Uh, besides the obvious example of Rolex or perhaps JLC making uh, movements for Audemars Piguet, we have you know, Patek Philippe watches using Lamania movements, the derivatives thereof. This was not a bad thing until the internet came along and started talking about in-house versus not in-house and some kind of implied value um, by, you know, building your own movement versus taking something that was essentially available for decades and is well proven. Manufacturers felt they had to make their own movements uh, to get the approval of, you know, watch aficionados which at the time, if you really think about it, if you were a true watch aficionado, you would know the history of Swiss manufacturer and you would understand the fact that, you know, everybody subcontracted out to everybody else. You know, I don't, I'm not sure actually today if Rolex makes everything on their own. I don't know if they made the crystal. I believe their hands were subcontracted until not long ago. So again, in-house, not in-house, what is it? To be honest, if you're going to really be a stickler for in-house and true vertical manufacture, there's probably only one brand you can look at, and that would be Seiko or Grand Seiko. I'll take this off my wrist for a better view. Now we've got the Seiko SBGV245 here. To my knowledge, Seiko is the only manufacturer that makes everything. I mean, they make their own lubrication oils, they make their crystals for the glass, they make their dials, the hands, the bracelets, they even grow the quartz crystals in-house and age them to perfection. Um, and other manufacturers go to them to make their cases. For example, I think uh, one well-known example is Casio's higher um, MRG line of watches. They do send them to... Uh, Seiko to do Zaratsu type uh, black polish finishing on the cases. But in the end, if, you know, in-house is what's important to you, there's really, you know, very few manufacturers to choose from and Seiko would probably be one of them, especially Grand Seiko. If you're really uh, after 
uh, true integration, true in-house manufacture, and optimal quality. So I think it's somewhat intellectually dishonest to give a knock uh, to Panerai, which use other companies to help them manufacture their watches and say, you know, for example, Rolex or other brands um, are somehow superior because they don't, because they did. And like I said, again, until 2004, when Rolex finally bought out their manufacturer, you could not honestly say that Rolex was an in-house brand. I mean, their movements were not made in the same factory as everything else was made. They did not own the manufacturer of their movements. They acquired them. Before that, they had a somewhat exclusive contract um, with Aigler. Aigler was making, you know, a lot of the movements for Rolex. And I don't think, I don't know of anybody else doing it, um, the making them for anybody else. But the fact was they were not part of Rolex until they were acquired. You know, Panerai was acquired by Richemont, so they're all in the same umbrella, much as, you know, Omega by Swatch Group and, and you know, ETA under Swatch Group. So is it in-house or not? You know, who's to say really? Depends on your definition. But all the hullabaloo, all the hype, you know, on the internet about, oh, Rolex, you know, Rolex is in-house. Panerai is just using off-the-shelf movements. Everybody used off-the-shelf movements for quite a long time, for decades. You know, Audemars Piguet, as I said, uses off-the-shelf movements or used off-the-shelf movements. They would have a high degree of finishing. Again, finishing, if finishing is what's important to you. There's some great finishing on this Panerai. But to be truth, to be fully truthful, uh, they were derivative. Almost everything is derivative. And that is okay. That is not what watchmaking was about. You know, originally watchmaking went to Switzerland, remember, because it was cheap. There was a lot of farmers there who couldn't do their farming in the wintertime, and they would sit in their little houses and make watch parts and sell them. Um, it was a network of you know, cottage industry that became what we know as the Swiss watch industry today. So I think there's a little bit of uh, intellectual dishonesty out there about knocking certain brands because of being in-house or not. And I think that is a, is a disservice to the community and, of course, to the people themselves talking about that. To be truly honest, you know, again, if you're going to say in-house and you're going to say in-house is what's valuable, there's very few brands you can choose from. Seiko would be probably the only one um, to go to Swiss, the Swiss manufacturers, the big ones at least, I would say. You know, obviously it would be JLC, Jacques makes, you know, their own uh, movements. And, you know, obviously someone like Philippe Dufour, you know, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He makes everything, you know, by hand. So that that's as close as you can get to fully in-house um, as is available uh, today on this planet. I think, you know, you have an individual, individual man making everything by himself. That is as in-house as you can get. But, you know, at the end of the day, how valuable is in-house? Do you, do you want an in-house movement that has not been um, tested for as long or you prefer a movement that has decades and decades of history behind it saying that it's you know very reliable, um, like the movement in this one? Um, the, the P3000 has been proven to be fairly reliable. I've had no problems with it at all and the timing is good. Uh, you know, what's really important is, you, you, does it give you more risk flex to say that that, that is you know, in-house uh, or is it just, just a, a label? that people are, are using for whatever, um, you know, kind of views they can get or attention they can get or whatever. I just think that, you know, as myself as a watch collector, having well over 150 watches in my collection with a large selection of brands, you know, I like each for what it is. I recognize the fact that there's more to a watch than a movement. You know, for example, I'm not a brand snob. I'm not a movement snob. I do, um, love my my grand seiko quartz watches you know people some people don't like quartz but i recognize the craftsmanship regardless so i don't you know have no issue with it. i think these are these are fantastic watches i don't have prejudices um about things like that and i think again if you're a true connoisseur of watches if you really love watches uh this this you know this buzz about in-house not in-house whatever is 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 overhyped and it's done for attention and it's done to sound knowledgeable when in fact it's the opposite of that. It is showing a lack of knowledge of the Swiss watch industry, of how things have been done, how things have always been done. Um, and it's very short-sighted and it isn't to knock um, 
any brand or a pump up any other brand either. I just think it, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's about honesty and about if you truly love watches and you truly um, care about watches and what they are and enjoy them, then you don't get hung up about such things. Uh, and you really have to approach, the, approach them objectively if you're going to start throwing labels around. So that's my 15 minutes or so um, little rant about honest, honesty in in-house, what it means, um, who really is in-house. What's the point of in-house and what does it mean to you? You know, comment down below if you have your own opinions. Obviously, I have mine. Um, and I think you know, watches are to be enjoyed. And that's really the bottom of it. You know, whether it's you know, a Panerai or a Seiko or a Citizen or a Rolex or a Patek Philippe, you buy your watches to enjoy them, not to, uh, you know, it's not about bragging about this or that. A true watch uh, aficionado doesn't really care to be honest. Uh, so that's it for me. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Uh, do you agree, disagree? Why? What does in-house mean to you? And is it important? Thank you. And I'll talk to you again next time. Bye.